Greetings, fellow Shadow Walkers. This is your host, Tim Woolworth. What you are about to hear is bonus content that is normally accessible through our Patreon. With each season of Walk in the Shadows, we will have two to three bonus episodes for patrons only. In addition to these bonus episodes, our patrons get free merchandise, access to a private Discord server, and access to Ask Me Anything sessions along with a host of other benefits. I do hope you enjoy this free content. And if you are interested in hearing more, please visit our Patreon. The link is in the show notes. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy this bonus content. Welcome to our Walk in the Shadows second bonus episode for our Noisy Spirit series. This bonus episode is best listened to during the interim between episodes three and four of our main series. This episode, like all other bonus content, would not be possible if it were not for the generous help of patrons like yourself. I want to thank you for that. Every dollar means a lot, because it brings us one step closer to our goal of being able to do this full-time and continually churn out our high-quality, well-researched content for you on a weekly basis. You were introduced to Harry Price in Episode 2, and Dr. Nandor Fodor in Episode 3 of our Noisy Spirit series. Both of these storied paranormal investigators worked on the same case at a lonely farmhouse on the top of Dalby Mountain on the Isle of Man. This isolated farmhouse, called Dorlish Cashin, had an exterior of slate and earthen mortar and an interior of wood paneling. Dorlish Cashin was located on a windswept, bleak, and foreboding land. The owners of the home, the Irvings, were a farming family that believed their home to be constructed somewhere around the year 1800. Subsequent geological study has revealed that the building's construction mirrored that of the Friary of Kirk Arbery on the Isle of Man, which was built around 1350. So either Dorlish Cashin is much older than thought, or it was built using ancient techniques that no one used in the 19th century. Regardless of age, there was a presence at Dorlish Cashin that is timeless in poltergeist lore. This case is so strange that it does not fully fit into the rubric established by parapsychical investigators for being a poltergeist case, even though it was investigated as such. Despite every aspect of this case being puzzling, the case in question is that of Jeff, the talking mongoose. The Irvings were a family of three persons, James, his wife Maggie, and their daughter, Vori, who was 11 years old when the event started in 1931. The Irvings had moved into Dorlish Cashin in 1917 and were well established in the home. They had worked the grounds to varied success over the years as farmers. The Irvings were not wealthy and struggled mightily at times. They led a quiet life until Jeff turned this all upside down and put the Irving Square in the spotlight of the worldwide press, the British Parliament, a British courtroom, curiosity seekers, and of course, parapsychical investigators. To start off the mystery of Jeff the Talking Mongoose, we'll begin with James Irving recounting his first encounter with Jeff. And I quote, One night in September of 1931, we heard a noise. Tap. 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 It came from our attic, which is boarded in. I thought we had mice. The next day, I opened up the attic through the ceiling and found there a little Indian wood carving which I recognized as my own. How it got into that enclosed attic, I could not tell. When I dropped it, it made the same sort of sound we had heard the night before. That same evening, we heard the same noise, but this time louder. It changed into a running noise. I said to my wife, That is no mouse. Next, we heard loud animal sounds barking, growling, hissing, spitting, and blowing. This was followed by a crack that shook the place and started the pictures on the wall swinging. By this time, we were sure some animal had somehow gotten into the attic, but that crack was strange. I didn't see how any animal could make it. While I was wondering this, something more happened that made us speechless with amazement and apprehension. That strange animal, whatever it was, was making gurgling sounds like a baby trying to talk for the first time. 
it sounded like this. Dama 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 blom blom blom. Then followed a bark with a note of inquiry and pleading in it. I was stunned. Almost mechanically, I repeated the noises of various animals. Bow wow, dog, meow, cat. And back from the somewhere came the same sound and the human word for it in a shrill and high-pitched voice that issued from a very small throat indeed. I was carried away with wonder. Some animal was actually taking lessons from me. In human speech, it was too amazing to be true. Not actually understanding or believing in the crazy thing I was doing. Nevertheless, I persisted. Or rather, this insatiable little creature persisted. He seemed to follow me around inside the empty space between the walls and kept at me for lessons. He questioned me continually and incessantly. He seemed crazy for knowledge. One more question, Jim, his voice would implore me. Then I let you go to sleep. And in a few weeks' time, he spoke fluently, using all our words and phrases, and plenty of others that were strange to us. I could not help thinking that if Jeff, as he wanted us to call him, knew how to speak all the time, and only pretended to learn from me lest he should scare us out of the house. But Jeff denied this. He said, For years, I understood all that people said, but I couldn't speak until Jim taught me. Over time, Jim realized that nothing could be hidden from Jeff. He observed all things that happened in the house, and could hear even hushed conversations exceptionally well. One time the family was whispering amongst themselves in those early days after meeting Jeff. The question of whether Jeff was a ghost or not was raised. Jeff replied, I am a ghost in the form of a weasel. I shall haunt you with weird noises and clanking chains. Then a clanking sound emerged that was underwhelming, like a spoon being hit against an iron. Jeff continually added to his mystery over the years. He proclaimed grand things about himself, such as, I am a freak. I have hands, and I have feet, and if you ever saw me you would be paralyzed, petrified, mummified, turned into a pillar of salt. I am the fifth dimension. I am the eighth wonder of the world. I can split an atom. I am the Holy Ghost. In the early days, there was tension between the Irvings and Jeff. To try to put these tensions at bay, Jeff threatened the family early on, saying that if the Irvings were kind to him, he would bless their home with good luck. Contrary to that, if the family were not kind to Jeff, he would kill their entire poultry flock. He said that he wasn't evil, and he did not wish to inflict harm, but he could kill the entire family if he wished. Not having any of this, Jim tried to kill Jeff with both rat poison and a gun. Jeff saw these attempts and raged. The house shuddered with banging and thumping. A saucepan of water was overturned on the stove. Miscellaneous objects were thrown. Jim eventually realized that Jeff was too wise. He could not be killed by any easy means. Plus, the Irvings had another worry. Jeff demonstrated that he knew how to light matches. When put in consideration with Jeff's earlier threats of hurting the family, they reasoned that if they continued trying to get rid of Jeff, he could quite possibly burn their house down. Once an understanding was reached, Jeff leaned into the Irvings a bit more. He was constantly asking the family to read papers and letters aloud so he could learn more of the human language. Now that an uneasy peace had been reached between Jeff and the family, Jeff considered the family as friends. Because he now trusted the Irvings, he started to make brief appearances. According to James Irving, the first appearance was when he laid out food for Jeff. I placed a saucer of stewed bilberries, sugar, milk, and bread on top of the staircase. Jeff ate and spoke to me while eating. He showed me the shadow of his front paw, or hand, holding the spoon. Then he rattled the saucer and blew out the candle. On another occasion, Jeff's fingers were made visible. He had instructed the family to go to a certain point in the house and look up at a slit in the ceiling. Jeff's fingers slowly moved through the opening. Long curved nails attached to the stubby, yellowish fingers appeared and then withdrew. In another event, in the dark, Jeff allowed Maggie to touch him. She was able to pet fur and stick her finger in Jeff's mouth without being able to see him. She said that, my long finger seemed to fill Jeff's mouth. His teeth were tiny and sharp. He drew a little blood from my finger. I was indignant. I said, I don't want blood poisoning here. He answered impatiently, go and put ointment on it. 
his mouth seemed to be about an inch wide. Starting in May of 1932, he grew very fond of worry. Once, when she was walking to a bus stop for school, Jeff had overheard a local kid proclaiming that the Dalby spook was coming. Jeff promptly hit that kid with a stone. Jeff also provided for the family. He would hunt rabbits that the Irvings would use for pelts and food to supplement their meager income. He would leave strangled rabbits on the porch until Vori to fetch them after he had dropped them there by shouting, he had got a rabbit. Vori's parents thought that maybe she was playing a trick and insinuated as such. Jeff heard this and it made him angry. As a result, when he hunted rabbits, he stopped dropping them on the porch and began telling Jim to go fetch them from the field after he had killed one. In addition to hunting, Jeff was useful on the farm as he protected the poultry that he once threatened. The Irving family began to rely on Jeff to protect their flock, and also the sheep and geese that they kept. Jeff told them that he would awaken them immediately if there were any threat to their livestock, or if someone were trying to break into their house. As he continued to listen to people who worked in the fields, Jeff picked up more of the human language. With his newfound words, he would question Jim nightly as to their meaning. More importantly, Jeff learned how to read. While no one is sure how Jeff learned how to read, James Irving postulated that Jeff had followed Vori to school and perched himself upon a tree branch and took in the lessons that Vori was learning on a daily basis. The entire Jeff situation was getting profoundly weird. first parapsychical investigator who arrived to investigate Jeff was Captain James Dennis, who was a member of the National Laboratory for Psychical Research. He visited on three occasions. At first, he felt that this must be a joke. On the second visit, he wanted to find the solution to the case that had eluded him on his first visit. And on the third visit, he came to the conclusion that there simply wasn't a conclusion to be found. On one occasion, Captain Dennis was conversing with the family in the kitchen. At around half past nine in the evening, the geese started honking furiously, something that they were akin to do whenever Jeff made his way towards the house. Yet Jeff did not announce himself until over an hour and a half later, after Vori had been sent to bed. Then it began. It started as an individual rap. Then, from seemingly all points at once, the rapping became furious and filled the air which was then followed by a couple of loud bangs from Vori's bedroom door. The rapping stopped, and Jeff screamed for them to go look. Captain Dennis climbed the stairs to Vori's bedroom and found that her door had been latched from the outside. With no other people in the house, this was an impossible feat. Somehow Jeff was able to manipulate the latch in a manner which made it lock. After unlatching the door, Everyone went downstairs and sat in the kitchen once more to discuss the events. Jeff was not done. Jeff made his way down the stairs, making his progress known by thumping on the wood paneling as he descended the staircase. Captain Dennis and the Irvings were poised to see Jeff as the thumping got closer to the bottom. When the thumping was so loud that they thought Jeff would emerge from the stairwell at any given moment, Captain Dennis leapt out of his chair and ran the couple paces to the bottom of the stairs, shining his flashlight up the stairwell expecting to see Jeff. There was the sound of scurrying up the stairs and a loud bang. The captain saw nothing, even as Jeff yelled out that he was a sly man. Jeff later revealed that as he was fleeing, he ran into Vori's door, forgetting that it was closed, and that was the source of the loud bang. On one other occasion, Jeff told Captain Dennis that he would throw pebbles at the window. Immediately afterwards, pebbles were hitting the window from outside, and Jeff was ordered to stop so he wouldn't break the glass. It was then that the stones began falling on the roof. Captain Dennis could not figure out how Jeff was talking in the house, but the otherworldly rain of stones was occurring outside at the same time. So he asked Jeff how he accomplished this feat. Jeff simply replied, That is Hindu magic. After these events with Captain Dennis, he would no longer cooperate with any investigator. 
he would not come down for Harry Price, who was at the house for one day, nor during the course of the one week that Nandar Fodor was staying at the house as an investigator. I mentioned that Jeff was unlike a typical poltergeist case, although he ticked a lot of the boxes. The evidence for Jeff being a poltergeist included there being an adolescent in the home, scratching at first, and then eventually building to rapping, banging, thumping, and cracking to the point where the house shuddered. There was stone throwing. There were flying objects and object manipulation, strange sounds, fire starting, biting, and speaking. But there are other things that fell outside the realm of the poltergeist, and this is the evidence which is exceptionally weird. Parts of Jeff were able to manifest, albeit briefly and only a couple times. He interacted with the family every day and held conversations. He killed rabbits for the family. He had left paw prints and dust, and he ate food, including an incident where he vomited carrots under Jim and Maggie's bed. Most importantly, he self-identified as an animal. You can easily see why this left investigators wanting. Jeff had the hallmarks of being both a poltergeist and a physical entity. In the end, Dr. Fodor did not believe that Jeff was a poltergeist or a spiritual entity. His reasoning was that, primarily, none of the family members were psychic. Secondarily, Jeff exhibited no truly supernormal powers or knowledge, despite occasionally giving the impression that he did. It should be noted that Jeff himself claimed that he was an earthbound spirit, and at another time, a ghost in the form of a mongoose. And finally, Jeff had been seen and touched, and he consistently appeared in the guise of a small furry animal. Dr. Fodor explained that, Poltergeists are always invisible. Jeff never claims to be without animal form. He eats, drinks, and sleeps. He leaves teeth marks in the butter in the larder, and in the fat of the bacon. He catches rabbits and performs various other services for the family. Poltergeists are an unmitigated affliction. Jeff is an asset. Fodor wrapped up his study of Jeff by saying that, All the probabilities are against it, but all the evidence is for it. He showed himself as an animal. He has the abnormal hearing, eyesight, and suspiciousness of an animal. Remarkable animals are known to have existed before Jeff. The Eberfield horses could extract cube roots and communicate thoughts by striking in code with their hoofs. Dogs have been taught to read and spell. Birds can speak the human tongue, but never has there been an animal as remarkable as Jeff. Do I believe in him? I have examined the evidence. I have tried all the possible solutions I could think of. None of them answers the case. All the evidence is in favor of Jeff's being a talking animal. I have not seen him. He did not talk to me. He claimed to be an animal. I cannot disprove that claim. In lieu of more positive information, and because I have not been, in all honesty, able to deny Jeff, I am forced to, if not accept, at least not negative his own quaint definition of himself. I am just an extra, extra clever little mongoose. Personally, I find this to be problematic, as speech is not something just any animal can learn, let alone in the span of a few days. Yet Jeff learned human language in a few days, fluently, and then was able to read. This is absurd, both scientifically and paranormally. From a scientific perspective, the vocal cords and associated biology of the mongoose have never evolved that way. From a paranormal aspect, there is no modern case where a creature has been able to vocalize as Jeff has. And to be honest, I am not wholly sure what Jeff was. Over the years at Dorlish Kashel, there were numerous visitors who heard Jeff's voice. During the captain's investigations, each member of the family was at one time locked outside of the room, yet Jeff still vocalized. This meant that ventriloquism or trickery was not possible and just deepens the mystery of Jeff the talking mongoose. Yet the fact that he did not manifest for other investigators is highly circumspect. If I had to hazard a guess after researching Jeff, I'd have to say I side with the conclusion of the great occult writer, Colin Wilson. He felt that Jeff was 
on the borderland between the straightforward poltergeist and the elemental or hobgoblin. Wilson also points out that in the late 19th century, the word poltergeist was often translated as hobgoblin in the English language. And interestingly enough, the hobgoblin was a mischievous house spirit. As we wrap up this bonus episode for our patrons, I'll leave you with one thought. When James died in 1945, the Irving family sold Dorlish Castle to the Duncan family. In 1946, Mr. Duncan proclaimed that he had shot a mongoose on the property. It should also be noted that until her death in the early 2000s, Vori vehemently maintained that Jeff was real and not a creation of the family. As you can tell, there is a lot of intrigue surrounding the case of Jeff the Talking Mongoose. Hollywood thinks so too, for in May of 2022, they began production on a film about Nandor Fodor and the Talking Mongoose. Thank you for your time spent walking in the shadows with me. I know your time is valuable, so I really appreciate you being here in this moment. This bonus episode was researched, written, and produced by me, Tim Woolworth. The audio wizardry is courtesy of our engineer and fellow explorer of the unknown, Joshua Sean at Zero G ITC. Hopefully, this episode made a little bit of our paranormal world more normal for you. As always, if you have any personal anecdotes, observations, or alternate explanations you would like to share on this or any other topic we've covered, or just maybe you would like to drop a note to say hi, you can always reach us via our email, contact at walkintheshadows.com. Once again, that's contact, spelled C-O-N-T-A-C-T, at walkintheshadows.com. If you think what Walk in the Shadows offers is a valuable service for sating your paranormal curiosity, Subscribe and review this podcast, and please, tell a friend. It really does help. If you want to learn more about this podcast or myself, please visit our Walk in the Shadows website. The link is in the show notes. On our website, you can find all of our social media accounts and our mailing list. Until next episode, may you and yours be healthy, prosperous, and treated with kindness by everyone you meet, both in the light and in the shadows.